Howdy folks, I'm Jeff Gonzalez, former Navy SEAL, founder of Trident Concepts and the host of the Bulletproof Workshop powered by AR15.com, where we discuss knowledge, skills, and ability to help bulletproof your everyday performance in whatever your field or passion. Welcome to Podcast 027. My next guest holds a PhD in economics and has worked at many prestigious institutions, including my favorite, Texas A&M. He has published several, book, several books, including More Guns, Less Crime, and The Bias Against Guns, both of which received wide, widespread praise from pro-gun rights groups and, of course, condemnation from the anti-gun groups. His research has single-handedly been the backbone or the centerpiece for just about any argument for or against guns in recent times. He's founded the nonprofit organization Crime Prevention Research Center to support his continued research. Through his research and involvement, he has helped usher the constitutional carry period we are now living, where half the states of the union do not require a permit to carry a firearm in public. He's a number cruncher, concealed carrier, anti-gun target, academic pariah, and gun crowd guru. Please welcome to the show, John Lott. How's it going, John? Doing great. Good to talk to you. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> yes, uh, Thank yes, you yes. for your service. Oh, appreciate that. Thank you very much. Well, I like to start the 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 show off by just kind of getting a little bit better knowledge, helping our audience to kind of come to know you a little bit more. And we like to start from the beginning. So where did you grow up? Uh, well, I was born in Detroit, but I grew up a lot in Miami, Florida. Nice. Nice. So South Miami. Nice. That must have been an interesting time period to be in Miami. Uh, well, it was the 60s and 70s, <laughs> so uh, uh, pretty much left Florida, though, around 76 or so. Interesting. Um, well, let's take a quick little break to thank our sponsors. Folks, this show is sponsored by 1776 Insurance. We're talking about comprehensive firearms collection coverage. That also includes your accessories as well as knives. If you've got questions or you want to learn more, please visit 1776insurance.com. All right, and we're back. So <clears throat> during your younger years, did you ever think that you would become the um, the gun gun crowd guru? Is that ever something that crossed your mind? Uh, no. I mean, uh, nobody in my family owned guns. Uh, you know, uh, my grandparents who kind of raised me a lot of the time uh, – were Democrats. I don't think, you know, they were kind of moderate Democrats, but I don't think, I think they would be shocked <laughs> by stuff that I do now. I know I am. I know my views have changed a lot over the last 25 years or so. Um, uh, I wouldn't think I was arguing the type of stuff I argue today, uh, you know, even in the mid or early 90s. That's, um, the thing that I find really interesting is the fact that, you know, you, you had an environment that was not necessarily um, very, not, not, and it wasn't even anti-gun. It just wasn't gun-ish. And through your academic journey, I would assume is where you started to kind of change that perspective. Yeah, no, it made a big difference. Look, uh, uh, my wife at the time uh, was Swedish and she was, very much into kind of gender neutral uh, raising of kids, uh, you know, anti-violent type stuff. Uh, she wouldn't let the kids have toy guns. Wow. And uh, she was very careful on what they were able to watch on television and stuff like that. I didn't argue. I didn't really care that much about those types of things. For it sure. It was important to her. Yeah. So, um, and uh so when I started doing, she has a PhD in economics also. Oh, wow. When I started doing this research in the area, uh, she was a tough critic <laughs> of uh, the <laughs> stuff that I was doing. And, uh, you know, uh, my views changed a lot while I was doing the research. I mean, I was kind of in the middle, but For I'm sure. sure I was uh, as affected by the media coverage. I mean, if you constantly hear only about bad things that happen with guns and don't hear about the benefits at all, I only got into this. I wasn't interested at all in the gun issue. Um, I'd been chief economist at the U.S. Sentencing Commission in Washington, and I'd done a number of papers on crime, but nothing on guns. I was teaching at the Wharton Business School nice. at the time. And uh, the class was on white collar and corporate crime mainly. Uh, but I made the mistake of telling uh, 
the students that we were ahead in the syllabus. And so I had a couple of students that came up to me after class one day and just said, we know this isn't exactly on topic, uh, but it does deal with crime a little bit. Would you mind giving a lecture on gun control if you have the time to do that? And I'd read <laughs> some papers in the gun control area. Uh, I thought they were really bad, but I assumed that there were other sure. better done papers out there. Uh, and if I was going to agree to do a lecture on it, I'd have to go and force myself to read through the other papers. Yeah. And uh, and I was pretty shocked by how poorly done the research was at the time. Really? Uh, there were very small studies. Somebody would look at, you know, they'd look at 32 counties from the United States. I don't know how you pick 32 counties <laughs> out of 3,140 counties. Um, or they'd That's look at one place over time or whatever. And when you're an academic, you do papers for one of two reasons. Either one, uh, you have a new idea, and that's been like 95% or so of the research that I've done over time. Nice. Or, um, or you think you could just do a better job on something. And this kind of fell into that second category. And um, I have to confess, uh, there were about six times when I was putting the data together that I just said, you know, this just isn't interesting enough. I'm not going to Was it interesting to you? Or yeah, you it wasn't didn't... interesting to ah, me. Gotcha. Because I usually, if you look at my academic papers, they're usually ideas that nobody's thought about before. Sure. And, uh, <clears throat> but um, I kept doing it and... Um, it was kind of by accident. I went to the University of Chicago then, and uh, uh, there was a graduate student there named David Mustard, who uh, I initially offered to pay to go and help me put the data together, but I gave him the option. I said, look, you know, you could either be a co-author, and then you get this for, you know, I don't have to pay you, <laughs> or, or uh, you know, you could, uh, I could pay you as a research assistant. He decided to be a co-author. Nice. And um, anyway, uh, uh, we finished the paper. And then uh, when I was chief economist in Washington, I'd gotten to know this reporter at USA Today named Dennis Kushan. And Dennis would call me up like once every six months or eight months with questions. And he called me up and he asked me his questions. And then at the end of the conversation, he said, oh, by the way, what are you working on? And I said, well, I just finished this paper. I originally was looking at like 13 different types of gun control laws, but uh, the only one that seemed to have any impact anyway in any, any direction on crime was concealed carry. And, um, and so uh, that's what the paper focused on, uh, though it's still controlled for the other ones that were there. And um, and Dennis said, well, you know, that sounds interesting. Why don't you send it to him? So I did. And a, about a week later, it was on the front page of USA Today. And that kind of uh, created a life of its own. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, anybody who looks at my work, I've I, up until that point uh, in my career, I do one or two or three papers in an area and then move on to something else. Um and uh, but in this case, uh, uh, what happened was uh, the paper got attacked a lot. Oh, uh, sure. And uh, and I kind of responded. And and one of the things that became clear to me pretty quickly is uh, just the amount of misinformation that's oh. out there. I've been involved in a number of academic debates over time, but I've never been in something that's had so much false information out there. Hmm. And I don't know. I guess I just kind of convinced myself that uh, if I didn't kind of deal with it, nobody would, uh, in part because it was so controversial. And it pretty much messed up my academic career. But mm -hmm. it's, uh, but it's, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's something that you don't think about all the consequences, I guess. Well, it's also probably pretty hard to even fathom them at that point. Uh, you know, you're kind of a you're within the group, if you will, and you wouldn't have expected the type of. Well, I mean, I'd done plenty of controversial stuff up till that point and um, never uh, got treated that way. When... Well, it was, you know, I'd been run into a few problems. Uh, my academic career I kind of was bouncing from one university to another because of some of the controversial stuff that I did. Huh. 
but uh, usually in an upward direction. But it, um, but you know, it still was uh, kind of the outside the university pressure on the university was different with the gun stuff than it had been for the other stuff. Well, I can, you know, being in the gun industry for as long as I have been, um, my my experience with the media is very similar in that sense. The the first thing that I learned early on was to not really or to expect that the information that they were sharing with me was wrong in a, because after a while I just kind of started to question like the journalist is supposed to come across as an authority figure at least somebody that has done some research that has some sort of um yeah. information database that they use to pull from and I quickly learned the hard way because I got burned several times that's not the case yeah no it's <laughs> I mean, uh, journalists are kind of a jack of all trades, master of none. Good point. And um, uh, I mean, I've been involved in, in the news business a little bit and kind of seen how it works up close. And what happens is, is that uh, reporters will often have kind of a meeting in the morning with their editor. Uh, they'll be assigned a story to go and work on for that day. And maybe by, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, they'll kind of know what they're supposed to be working on. And then they you know, they are unlikely to know who the experts are in the area. So they go and do a Google search or something, <laughs> yeah. look up uh, some names, and then uh, they'll make a few calls and, um, uh, you know, and then they'll start to write up their piece. And maybe by like two in the afternoon or three, uh, they'll have their piece and they'll show it to their editor and the editor will look at it and then, you know, it'll be in the paper the next day. Yeah. So, uh you know, you can't really expect them to have uh, a detailed knowledge about the thing. What's, but media has changed a lot over the last 20 years or so. Uh, uh, you used to at least have this desire for reporters to at least go through the motions to have people on both sides of the debate. Right. Now you can read a lot of articles in the New York Times and Washington Post and places like that where on a broad range of issues, they only talk to people on one side of the issue. It's kind of like they want to communicate to their readers that there is really no other side to talk to. But that still doesn't mean that they still couldn't bias it a lot. And the bias against guns, uh, I kind of go through uh, some of the reporting at the time by like the New York Times. So they would, New York Times, if you look at their reporting on on research on guns, uh, the only studies that they would do stories on would be ones that were pro gun control. Mm -hmm. uh, but what they would do is they'd have people on both sides, but on the pro gun control side, they'd have a couple of academics saying what a wonderful paper it is. Mm. And then on the other side, they'd have like a gun dealer and ask something from the NRA. Mm -hmm. And so they could go and say, well, we interviewed people on both sides. Yeah. But, you know, any kind of unbiased reader would say, well, you know, the academics think this is a wonderful paper. And this gun dealer, who I don't suspect knows anything about the research, <laughs> says that he doesn't like it. And the NRA is refusing to comment on it. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, it's who are you going to believe, these unbiased academics? Or are you going to believe uh, somebody who has a vested financial interest uh, in it? And so they could go and say that they did on both sides, but obviously it wasn't balanced uh, even then. But, you know, and the other thing, when you talk to reporters, uh, a reporter can talk to you for a half hour or something, and there'll be certain things that you say that are strong arguments, and you may make a weak argument. And if they don't like you, they'll pick the weakest uh -huh. argument that you make there. Yeah. Uh, and if they do, they'll take your strong arguments that you make. But it's... But you see the bias in many ways. I've stopped doing uh, recorded interviews on NPR maybe, I don't know, almost 20 years ago um, because uh, uh, they would take things out of context. And uh, so uh, the last time I did an interview with NPR, uh, Morning Edition, um, they interviewed me for three hours. Wow. And then uh, the woman called me back the next day and said that none of it was usable, that they still had to go and ask me questions. It was like the same question over and over and over again. Yes. You were in slightly being different ways. <laughs> well, it was just somehow I, I think they think if they 
keep asking the same question, then kind of out of boredom or whatever, you'll go and change your answer a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And um, and so finally, in frustration, it was about the suits against the gun makers. Yeah. And uh, so finally, out of frustration, she said, uh, uh, <laughs> "Well, uh, but if it was true, because I kept on telling her the point she was making wasn't correct." She says, but if it wasn't true, wouldn't this follow? Uh, and I said, well, it's not true. But if it was, then this would be the case. But it's not true. And uh, and so they cut out the two not true parts on the sides. <laughs> oh, my God. And the uh, NPR report basically came down to saying people on both sides of the gun control issue agree on this. And oh my so God. they had— Somebody from the gun control, and then they had me. Oh, both, and they, and so you know, obviously, uh, they have a certain kind of template that they want to for sure put things in, yeah. And, um, but uh, you know, um, uh, places like the Washington Post, the New York Times, and uh, the other major media. You know, and it's not just uh, the news media. One thing that we do at the Crime Prevention Research Center is we keep track of uh, television kind of cop shows and how they cover uh, news. If you go to our website, we have regular clips that we kind of pull out from the shows. And uh, <clears throat> just as an example, I mean, you look over the last 15, maybe 20 years of uh, television uh, entertainment cop shows, uh, you will search in vain for any examples of civilians successfully using guns to uh, protect themselves. Um, the only shows that I know, only show that I know of that's shown successful defensive gun uses uh, was Yellowstone. Uh, they've had two episodes, uh, one in particular where a young boy uh, uses a gun to protect his mother. Yeah. Uh, the other one is a little bit more ambiguous, uh, but... Um, uh, all the other shows um, have either uh, the civilian accidentally shooting the wrong person mm. or uh, having the gun taken away from them and used against them or, uh, you know, the gun being stolen from them or something going wrong with it uh, or them interfering with the police going and doing their job. Wow. So just uh, the other day, um, uh, ABC's The Rookie uh, just had an example where uh, there was a bank robbery. A uh, police officer c kind of was there and hiding on the side, waiting for an opportunity until other police arrived. Uh, and uh, a civilian there with a concealed handgun came out. She warned him not to get involved. Uh, he went out there anyway, uh, got shot, and uh, ended up getting a civilian shot and Ooh. wounded. Uh, and, of course, didn't stop the criminals at all. Right. And uh, and they have um, uh, the police officer uh, saying, you know, another good guy with a gun completely messing everything up. Wow. And uh, CBS's uh, FBI Most Wanted uh, also had a very similar scenario that was there where the FBI agent basically castigates the the civilian saying, you're not law enforcement. You shouldn't get involved. There's no, you should leave this to the professionals. And that's a theme. Yeah. And we've seen this a lot uh, in this 2022-23 uh, season, I think, even more than in past years. And that's because of the Bruin decision yeah. from the Supreme Court. And so uh, um, uh, what you read news articles where you see that uh, gun control groups work actively with producers and others uh on these TV shows to kind of get their message across. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty clear that it gets across all the time. So, uh, you know, one other I just kind of example I'll give, and that is uh, uh, the season before last, we actually did a count, and about 85% uh, of the guns used in crime on television and cop shows were machine guns. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and it, I'm sure it's pretty similar percentage all the time. Uh, since, uh, the late 1930s, there's been only one murder in the United States with a machine gun, but yet, you know, you watch something like Magnum PI or something and you have more murders in Hawaii with machine guns <laughs> than, uh, you know, by a factor of like 
five in one episode yeah. than you've had in the United States as a whole, you know, in almost 100 years or 90 years. So it, um, you know, it's just crazy stuff. But it's it's funny that you I, I'm so glad that you brought that up because, you know, I try to relay um, and and we'll we'll um, we'll peel. There's so many layers that I want to go into on this. But as we see so many new gun owners come into um, or I should say so many new individuals coming into the gun world as gun owners, first time gun buyers, the amount of and for lack of a better word, brainwashing that they have undergone oh, yeah. through, through media, through television Schooling and everything. Exactly. <clears throat> it has been. I wouldn't say an uphill battle, but it's been an interesting kind of conversation piece that I have to share with them because a lot of the information that they're getting is not, it's like you were saying, there, there is a clear agenda from the anti-gun movement to uh, desensitize people to the restrictions that they're trying to impose by making it seem, as you said, very well, they're, commonplace. They're, yeah. I mean, the bias is in so many different ways. Uh you have things like even the surveys that are done where they'll say, you know, 95% of people support uh, these universal background checks or two-thirds of people support red flag laws mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they want to make people who oppose these things feel isolated and out of step and just kind of they don't understand the issues apparently. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with just kind of how uh, uh, the polls ask the question. So on the red flag laws, they'll say, um, do you support judges being able to temporarily take away a gun from somebody who's a danger to themselves or others? And that seems pretty reasonable. In fact, every state already has such a law right. in effect. Yeah. It's called involuntary commitment. The thing yeah. is, those laws require that you have to have a hearing, mm. um, and if uh, you can't afford a lawyer, one's provided, and witnesses are cross-examined, and mental health care experts are involved in the process. And and if you ask people, uh, because the red flag laws don't have any of that, yeah. what a red flag law does is uh, somebody will make a written complaint. A judge will see a written complaint in front of them, and only based on maybe one single written complaint, the judge will make the decision to go and take away somebody's gun. Yeah. The judge never even talks to the person who makes the written complaint that's there. Mm. There's no cross-examination, no hearing, no mental health care professionals involved. Um, and if you merely say, okay, do you support a law that allows judges to temporarily take away a person's guns if they're a danger to themselves or others? And you get like two to one support. If you if you say, how does your does your opinion of the law change if you're told that there's no hearing mm. and that there are no mental health care professionals involved? It goes from two to one support to almost two to one opposition. Yeah. And you see similar things with other surveys that are there. Um, but the other point I want to make is um, uh, with regard to the news coverage. So. Um, you know, you go and uh, so, for example, recently, uh, the gun violence uh, organizations uh, were lobbying the CDC to go and take certain information off of their website with regard to defensive gun uses. The gun violence archive, which is like fawned over by the media, <laughs> um, was arguing that uh, 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 they should remove it because it was making it difficult for them to pass the types of gun control yeah. laws that they want to have. And that it would be much better measure of defensive gun use to look at the number of news stories on defensive gun uses and just count those up. And so mm -hmm. this last year, they had a little bit over a thousand stories that they said they found across the country on defensive gun uses. And that was a more realistic measure. You know, it's just not even serious taking these discussions. Uh, uh, only about 22% of violent crime are even reported to police. Uh, so the media is not going to be covering the other 78% right. of the cases. Uh, but beyond that, even the 22% of violent crimes are reported to police. I mean, the media only reports on a tiny fraction of those yeah. that are there. And, and if you break down uh, the defensive gun uses, what you find is that um, about the majority of cases – are involve instances where the attacker has been killed. About 42% uh, 
of the cases involve instances where the attacker has been wounded. And only 4% of the defensive gun uses that the media reports on uh, involve instances of brandishing. Right. And most of those involve instances where uh, the criminal has been held at gunpoint until the police arrive, right. which is unusual. And the thing is, the research, I think, indicates that about 95% of the time brandishing is actually what it happens to go and stop an attack. People rarely fire the gun. You're yeah. talking about less than 1% of the time are the attackers killed or wounded, way less. And yet, you know, the it's not a mystery there. You know, it's kind of the old adage, if it bleeds, it leads. If you're <laughs> if you're if you're an editor of a news bureau and you have two stories that cross your desk, one case there's a dead body on the ground, a sympathetic victim's been killed. Or another case, let's say a woman's brandished a gun, the would-be attackers run away, no shots are fired, no dead body on the ground. Yeah. You're not even sure what crime would have been committed if the woman hadn't used the gun. What story are you going to go with? Yeah. I think you or I or virtually anybody would go and be much more likely to cover uh, the dead body on the ground than yeah. on the case where we're not even sure what crime would have been committed. Even th So the point is, what's newsworthy doesn't often give an accurate reflection of reality yeah. that's going on. Uh, I can understand why the news covers certain things, but if we're interested in public policy, we care about both the cases where there's a dead body on the ground sure. and a case where um, somebody uses a gun to stop an attack with simple brandishing. So, um, you know, there's so many biases there. But and the bottom line is if, if you uh, constantly hear about bad things that happen with guns mm -hmm. and almost never hear about any of the benefits of people using guns, you know, it's not too surprising that people are going to come out in favor of gun control. So I'll give you one last example. Please. That is, um, uh, last year we did a report on uh, media coverage on defensive gun uses. And uh, if you look at the top five newspapers in the United States, for example, um, uh, the New York Times, the LA Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, uh, between those five papers during the first nine months of last of 2021, uh, they had a total of 10 defensive gun use stories hmm. combined. And most of those had something go wrong. You know, the person right. shot the wrong person or whatever. By contrast, they had over 1,700 news stories where uh, somebody was uh, criminally killed or wounded in a crime. And they had over 2,700 news stories total of involving gun crimes. Wow. And uh, so, and you add in CNN and MSNBC that had <laughs> zero stories of defense of gun uses. Somebody could think, look, I'm a well-read news person. I yeah. follow the news carefully all the time. Uh, you know, I read the New York Times. I read the Washington Post. I watch CNN. I watch MSNBC. And- you know, maybe they don't see any defensive gun uses, and yeah. but maybe the one or two that they saw involve instances where something went wrong yeah. with the person using a gun defensively. And by contrast, they can recall what seems like thousands of gun crimes that are occurring over the same period yeah. of time. And so who can blame somebody from not coming away with that and thinking, look, there are lots of gun crimes. There's no benefit for people having guns. So why not just ban all guns? Yeah. Because maybe we'll stop some of these crimes, but at the same time, uh, you know, there's no cost to banning them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, few people would know that the data shows that people use guns defensively about five times more frequently each year to stop crime than, than guns are used to commit crime. Few people would know that over 92% of violent crime has nothing to do with guns. Right. But uh, the other thing that uh, I would point out is that there are lots of places in the world that have tried to ban guns. We've had Chicago and Washington, D.C. in the United States, but we've had island nations that have tried to ban guns. Yeah. And every single time 
that you've banned either all guns or all handguns, murder rates have gone up. Yeah. If you think on net guns are bad, then you would think it should be easy to find cases where you ban guns. I mean, if this kind of image in the media is accurate, yeah. then you would think that it should be easy to find cases where you ban guns and murder rates fell down. Yeah. But you think out of randomness, you'd find at least one case where murder rates either went down or at least stayed the same. And yet every single time where guns are banned, uh, murder rates go up and often by huge amounts yeah. immediately after the ban. And there's a simple explanation for that. And that is when you, and this applies to gun control generally, you, but you have to be careful that when you pass a law, you're not going to be primarily disarming law-abiding citizens. You may take make it a little bit more difficult for criminals to get guns. Yeah. But if you're primarily disarming law-abiding citizens with a law, and there, if you ban guns, it's going to be the most law-abiding good citizens who turn in their guns. True. Then, uh, then you make it so that it's actually easier for criminals to go and commit crimes. Well, and and so much to unwrap there. Um, when I, you know, when I became more, and my viewpoint was much, I would say, like I tried not to get involved. Uh, even though I had been in the industry, I didn't feel like, eh, you know what, I'm not the person to really go out there and start uh, hammering details or trying to bring attention to this or whatnot. And I regret that because, you know, I kind of was complicit in seeing the continuation of, of what we see, you know, now. But what I what I find very hard to wrap my head around is when we try to pass laws to protect um, the communities the one falsehood is that a criminal perpetrator is already going to be breaking the law to commit the crime there. If we didn't have any crime, then we wouldn't have to worry about guns, but because we still have criminals breaking the laws, what, why would other people believe that new gun laws would actually increase public safety? Well, I mean, it's possible it makes it riskier for criminals to go and commit crimes and, you know, higher penalties. Um, but, you know, I'll give you an example. You take something like uh, gun-free zones, and you're let's talk about it in terms of mass public shootings. Perfect. So <clears throat> somebody's going to go in there, and they're going to go and plan on killing, you know, eight, nine, ten people or more. Mm -hmm. um, there may be a three-year prison term for going and uh, – carrying a gun into a gun-free zone. Right. Um, but if the person's already expecting to get nine life sentences or something like that, is a three-year additional <laughs> penalty going to say, you know, I have these nine life sentences, but, you know, gosh, I'm also that. going to be facing this gun-free zone charge. <laughs> and, you know, that extra three years, I, Ooh, I'm just not willing puts to- Puts me over the edge. <laughs> yeah, I'm not willing to go and, and deal with that. That's my line in the sand. <laughs> but- uh, but, you know, for a civilian who's law-abiding, correct? three years being a felon, uh, that is really life-altering to be able doubt. to get it. So what you have is a situation where law-abiding citizens who maybe even without the penalty would obey the law, Yeah, uh, you know, think, you know, I, I don't want to risk being a felon. If I'm a felon, uh, I'm going to lose my business license or professional license. My life's going to be unalterably changed. Yes. Um, and, uh, and one of those big changes, you become a prohibitive possessor. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So exactly. And so, um, you're, you are in a situation where uh, the law abiding citizens obey the rule and, uh, it makes it and the criminal then goes into an area where he believes that the victims there aren't going to be able to go and defend themselves. Yeah. And so rather than being a law that actually pr stops the criminal from attacking in those sensitive areas, it actually makes it more likely that they're going to attack in those sensitive areas. These guys may be crazy in some sense, and they may want to commit suicide, but they're not stupid. Their goal is to get media coverage, and they know the more people they kill, the more media coverage that they're going to be able to go and get. And you know, I was when I was chief economist at the U.S. Sentencing Commission. I must have read over a, a thousand criminal trial transcripts. <laughs> and one thing uh, that you just comes across time after time is that 
criminals are like other people in the sense that if they can accomplish the same job in an easier way, they're going to do that. So if they have, you know, you'll be reading uh, uh, a story of a robber and he, maybe his uh, accomplice has turned state's evidence against the, uh, the other guy and, and, they'll, and the prosecutor will go and say, you know, how did you pick this particular victim? And the guy will say, well, you know, we talked about going after the drug dealer down the street, but, you know, he's really well armed and it would be really crazy for us to go after him. Right. And then we talked about maybe going after a cab driver, but, you know, a lot of the cab drivers have guns and that was, we decided not to do it. And then we saw this small woman walking across a parking lot late at night yeah. by herself and she seemed like a really easy target. And so we decided to go after her. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, uh, and you just, you read these transcripts one after another, <laughs> and you just see, you know, these guys are not that stupid. You know, they, and... As uh, much as we would like them to be stupid, yeah. they're really not. Yeah, I mean, they may not be the s sharpest knives in the drawer, but these are not, these are not difficult issues for yeah. them to go and deal with. And you read, you know, one of the things that just drives me nuts about the bias in the media, um, you know, the New York Times just had uh, six uh, weekend up long editorials about uh, right wing violence uh, in the United States mm -hmm. and the threat that it has. And kind of uh, their exhibit A uh, for multiple of the stories was the Buffalo mass murderer from last year mm -hmm. at the grocery store. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, there's so many layers of bias there. But uh, just <laughs> one thing that drives me nuts is with all the coverage that they've given to the Buffalo mass murder, not one time did the, in their discussions about his manifesto, not one time did they mention his discussion about why he picked the target that he did. And the reason why he picked the target that he did was because he talks about how important it is to go to a place where his victims wouldn't be armed. Yeah. Because he said, you know, if you have a lot of armed victims, that makes it difficult, like running into a lot of armed police officers. Yeah. They, <laughs> you know, it'll make it much more difficult to kill them. Um, uh, you know, it, and, and that's, you see that in many diary discussions, in many manifestos. I mean, of course, there are other biases there. Uh, you know, the guy was a racist. Yeah. And so, um, uh, the media, uh, New York Times and everybody else calls him a right winger. Uh, the thing is, if you read his manifesto, which they claim that they did, uh, the reason why he's a racist is because he was an environmentalist. He was upset about uh, minorities having too many kids. And uh, he <laughs> was upset that having kids damaged the environment. environment yeah. And uh, and so he calls himself an eco uh eco-fascist, and he calls himself a socialist. So I don't know about you, but at least the conservatives that I know are not really upset about people having more kids, and they're not really calling themselves socialists or calling themselves eco-fascists. Yeah. And, uh, but, um, you know, uh, those were his descriptions of himself, but yet you will search in vain in any of the mainstream media, uh, and he's not the only one. And, of course, um, the New York Times. Uh, so, like, if you look at all the mass uh, public shooters over the last 25 years or so, 72% um, uh, uh, of them have no discernible political views. Uh, they're basically people who wanted to commit suicide and wanted to get media attention. Yeah. Um, Nine percent. Uh, could be in the general thing of being uh, neo-Nazi or being uh, uh, anti-immigrant or being uh, uh, just a racist or whatever. Uh, but most of those are, you know, classify themselves as socialists and stuff. <laughs> and yet the media <laughs> will, and, and the Biden administration will make it look like somehow there's you know, a surge in right-wing uh, violence that's been occurring there. And, uh, you know, it's been a number one focus for the FBI now for a couple of years. But it's just, <clears throat> it's just kind of amazing how much, I mean, just since we're talking about media bias, it's just another example there. If you're 
racist than you're a conservative. <laughs> An interesting point um, that I try to share with people that are coming into the industry uh, for defensive gun use education and training has to do with just, you know, mindset being a big one, but also being able to understand your um, your potential adversary, you know, understanding your potential adversary, what, what, what makes them tick of sorts. And <clears throat> one of the things that I try to impart on them is that, you know, these guys are smart, they're street smart. And that is, that is a very powerful tool when you are on the street. So the street being almost like the Serengeti and any, any predator on the, on, you know, whether it be on the streets in Chicago or on the Serengeti, you know, their primary goal is to avoid injury number one, and incarceration in our case, number two. Those are the main drives as far as um, victim selection. They want to make sure they're picking somebody that is an easy target so they can avoid going to jail or avoid going to the hospital. And when I try to put that into terms for the um, new student to understand, it's it's sometimes difficult for them to put that in perspective. Um and that, that was just an observation that I wanted to share just because of the way that you brought that up. It, 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 right. it seems so common sense to people that that should be how they uh, understand their adversary, but yet they really, really don't. You know, it's bizarre. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we've had a big increase in violent crime over the last couple of years in the United States. And to me, I don't know, it seems pretty straightforward. Uh, you go and you cut police budgets. Uh, you make it difficult for police to go and do their job. Yep. You know, New York City cut their police budget by a billion dollars. You had <sighs> Chicago cut the number of police officers in 2020 by 400 slots. Um, you have uh, district attorneys across the country who are refusing to prosecute violent criminals. Uh you have uh, uh, liberal judges in many parts of the country releasing in some urban areas half or even in few cases over two-thirds of the inmates from jails. Um, you've had bail reform. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example with regard to bail reform. You know, a year ago you had um, uh, this guy who drove his SUV through this Christmas parade in oh, Wisconsin, yeah. killing six and sending 61 people to the hospital. Oh, uh, he uh, had been out on bail. He had uh, attempted uh, or had, had run over uh, the mother of his child with the same car uh, and had been charged with attempted murder and faced three other felonies. If you add up the potential prison time that he was facing, it was about 30 years. Uh, he's 38 years old. He's already facing another, effectively another life sentence with 30 years there. And, uh, and so the question is, he's already facing 30 years, and you've left him out on the street for $1,000 bail, which basically meant he had to put up $100. Yeah. What additional penalties are you going to be able to put on him? You're yeah. going to give him a second life sentence? Yeah. So he goes and murders somebody. You're going to say, okay, well, the, he's already facing one life sentence, but it's the second life sentence without parole that will go and stop him. You know, the third life sentence, the fourth life sentence, the fifth life sentence, the sixth life. If he faces seven, you know, he gets six other life sentences for just the murders that he does there. You know, the notion is, there's no additional marginal penalty yeah. that you can impose on the guy. But yet you've let him out for $100 there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, in Harris County, Texas, uh, you have a situation where kind of a Soros-type district attorney has uh, uh, you kind of uh, changed the bail uh, rules there. And you've had a number of people who were facing trials for uh, murder, uh, who committed more murders when they were let out on on bail, uh, or no bail, you know, essentially just tiny amounts of bail if they had a bail. And so is that surprising? I mean, um, there's a, there's like no notion of, of the incentives that are there. But look, the bottom line is that, uh, and this is the point you're making, if you want to make it you want to reduce crime, you have to make it risky and costly for criminals to go and commit crime. And unfortunately, you know, so are they surprised that in California where you can take up to $950 of something from a store and yeah. you're just going to have a ticket 
uh, essentially, that there's no criminal prosecution that you're going to face, that you're going to see a lot more of that. But we live in this weird world right now Very much where so. um, uh, you have lots of people who are refusing to let law enforcement broadly do its job. And at the same time, they want to make it so that civilians themselves aren't going to be allowed to go and protect themselves. Yeah. And so much of this is phrased in terms of uh, diversity or equity type yes. stuff that we need to, you know, we can't be mean to uh, to minorities. Yeah. Who do they think are the victims of these crimes? So, uh, you know, you have over 90 percent of murders by blacks are of other blacks. Yeah. And so uh, people tend to commit crimes in their local area. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, the the victims, the direct victims of the crime are other minorities, but the indirect victims of the crimes are other minorities. If you go and rob uh, or assault, um, businesses go out of business. Yeah. Uh, who owns some of those businesses? Who works in those businesses? Who shops in those stores yeah. that are there? Yeah. And even the stores that don't go out of business, uh, their prices are higher yeah. because of the theft yeah. and other things that they're dealing with. Who owns homes in those areas when property values fall yeah. or are depressed because of the high crime yeah. that's in those areas? It's the same type of people. You know, blacks commit crimes against blacks generally. Hispanics tend to commit crimes generally against Hispanics. So, you know, uh, they say they care about these minorities. Um, but, you know, Biden, uh, you will search in vain for any discussions that he has about uh, uh, these district attorneys refusing yeah. to prosecute violent criminals. You will search in vain for him criticizing any of these liberal judges that are letting out huge numbers of inmates. Yeah. Uh, you will search in vain for any criticism of him uh, about the bail reform yeah. that's there. You know, instead, um, he's virtually always just focused on guns as the issue involving violence. But as we mentioned earlier, over 92 percent, and this has been true for decades, over 92% of violent crime has nothing to do with guns. Yeah. And if you want to go and reduce violent crime, you have – and violent gun crime is the same thing. You have to make it risky for the criminals to go and commit those crimes. Quick word from our sponsor. We've been working with the folks at 1776 for comprehensive insurance of our firearms collections, and um, I'm really happy with how things are going so far. And one of my concerns is with the amount of commuting that I do with my firearms collection – um, what happens should my vehicle be broken into or stolen with my firearms? And there's reason to have this concern because there's 800,000 vehicles stolen per year in America. So it's not, you know, it's, it's a little bit more common than we might think. What I mentioned earlier is that they have a comprehensive insurance plan, which is that they will cover your firearms stolen out of your vehicle or should your vehicle be stolen, cover the firearms that were in the vehicle. So that's pretty, you know, pretty reassuring in a sense. So I've mentioned this before, but the process to apply is pretty easy. Uh, approval is pretty quick. They do not require you provide a itemization or serialized numbers. There's no appraisal or schedules that you have to provide. So really all you want to do is just make sure you have proof of ownership and that's it. So if you want to learn more about the folks from 1776 and insuring your firearms collection, visit 1776insurance.com. So here's another interesting, I'd love your take on this. During, you know, during the pandemic, we saw a lot of things happen. We saw lockdowns. We saw um, goods and services restricted. We saw, uh, well, shortly thereafter, we saw riots and we saw the defunding of the police and we saw a surge in gun ownership increase. And the way that I interpret that is that many people started to realize that they no longer could rely on <clears throat> others, in this case, law enforcement, to protect them. Right. They no longer had that 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 bubble that they had over their head about, you know, law enforcement will come, law enforcement right, sure. will come, was gone. Are we, like, are we entering a new phase of sorts of gun ownership at this point? Are we with this, I mean, we're at, what, 22 million license to carry permits being issued and that's only the states that actually are keeping those records because well, all the states, states keep the records but the the thing is now we have 25 constitutional carry states exactly. and so 
what you find is that um, the increases in permits have been in the states that aren't constitutional carry. The constitutional carry states have, have maybe seen most recently a slight decline in the number of concealed carry permits. Sure. Uh, in the past, even in the constitutional carry states, people have had an incentive to still get permits to go and travel to other states. But For now sure. that you have 25 constitutional carry states, yeah. and most likely this year, Florida and Nebraska are right. going to be able to get it. Uh, you know, the incentives for going and getting a permit are going down a yeah, lot. It really is. You don't need to worry. And, and these states are pretty much adjacent to other constitutional carry states. Yeah. And so, you know, it's not much of a need to go and get a permit anymore. It's really changed in the last few years. For sure. And um, uh, uh, so, I mean, I think, uh, uh, but as you say, you have 22 million. The thing is, the only hard data that we have on gun ownership is uh, from concealed carry permits. Uh, you know, otherwise you rely on surveys. Yeah. And there are lots of problems with surveys. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll give you one simple example. Please. And that is um, uh, uh, if you ask a married woman or a married man whether a gun is owned in the home, uh, married men are about 15 percentage points more likely to say a gun is owned in the home than a married woman is. Now, is it that you have guys who like to pretend they own a gun, you know, uh, or huh. and or is it that uh, they just haven't told their wives that they own a gun? Or just seen the credit card statement yet? <laughs> yeah. Or or is it just that the wives are more reticent to go and tell a stranger who's calling them up on the phone uh, that uh, a gun is owned in the home there? My guess is it's primarily the latter, but uh, you know wh who knows for sure. But if but if uh, if it is the latter, then you know you're probably talking about um, uh, you know a six seven percentage point underestimate in the surveys of gun ownership that's there. And uh, um, but uh, you know it's kind of reminds you of these surveys that ask men and women how often how many sexual partners they've had sure. and things like that. Like, <laughs> guys, There's a bias there. <laughs> right. You guys are a lot higher than, than women. girls. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, obviously that can't work out, but it's just, uh, um, uh, or guys are counting their dreams or something. I have no <laughs> idea. But um, uh, anyway, uh, I, I'm just saying uh, you, you have, and I could go on, there are lots of yeah. other issues that are there, but yeah. Uh, it's really the only hard data that we have, and you'll see things like the biggest increases in concealed carry permits have been among women and uh, minorities. Uh, uh, women, uh, the growth rate over the last eight years or so has been about 110% faster than for men. Yeah. I mean, women now make about 30% of permit holders, so they're still a minority, but they've been increasing uh, quickly. And blacks... Uh, have increased by more than 100% faster than for whites over that s same period of time. Well, the I think, and you can you can you can interpret the data in, in a lot of different ways. But the way that I interpret the data is that I think people are starting to become more aware of the reality of where they're at, uh, the fact that crime is on a rise. Right. No, I think you're exactly right. Yeah. And it's, it, and it's, I think, but my question to you is like now, you know, it will be difficult to track actual uh, like realistic data as far as gun ownership, but does this change like your, your seminal work, you know, more guns, less crime really put in context, what made a difference, what actually made a difference in reducing crime with this new surge of gun ownership, can we expect to see similar trends? Or? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it'll be some benefit. I think it depends a lot on who's getting the guns. Um, uh, if my work teaches me anything it's or convinces me of anything, it's basically there are two groups of people who benefit the most from having guns. Uh, the people who are most likely victims of violent crime, and that's overwhelmingly poor blacks who live in high crime urban areas. Yep. Um, you know, you could have more guns for wealthy whites who live in the suburbs, but you're not going to see the same reduction in violent crime as if you see more poor blacks. And that's one thing about the constitutional carry movement. 
Um, it lowers the fees, lowers yeah. the cost for people getting the guns. And I think it makes it more likely that the very people who benefit the most are going to get it. The other group of people who benefit the most from having guns are are people who are relatively weaker physically, women and the elderly. Mm -hmm. You're almost always talking about a young man uh, committing the crime. Yep. And when a man is attacking a woman, there's a larger strength difference that exists there than when a man's attacking another man. And the presence of a gun represents a much bigger relative change in a woman's ability to go and resist an attack than it does for a man. And the thing is, one of the things with the move to constitutional carry is um, how quickly somebody can obtain a gun. So, for example, if a woman's being stalked or threatened, um, you know, you live in a state, let's say, like Connecticut or something, uh, you have to go and get your training, which could take a couple of weeks. And then you, and then, but let's say you already have your training. Um, uh, it takes at least uh, two months to be able to go and get a concealed carry permit. In some parts of Connecticut, it takes a year. Yeah. Well, guess what? Uh, you know, uh, two months or a year for sure, the problem may have already manifested itself. Yeah, she exactly. may have already been killed or something <laughs> exactly. during that period yeah. of time. And so, uh, you know, we live in a world where, you know, if the woman's already trained, if she's already competent, uh, she's able to go, if you're in a constitutional carry state, able to go and quickly obtain a gun uh, to be able to go and protect herself. You know, this brings up another thing. We have uh, the, one of the big pushes for the gun control people are these universal background checks. Right. And you'll see uh, these surveys where they'll claim, you know, 95% or 97% of people support. And if you read the questions, what they'll say <laughs> is, uh, uh, do you support background checks on all gun sales in order to prevent criminals from getting guns? And people will say, yeah, you know, seems reasonable. That's reasonable. Uh, the thing is, um, you know, the laws just aren't one sentence. Yeah. The laws are, you know, 20 pages with yeah. all sorts of complicated stuff. So I'll give you an example. Um, let's say uh, you know a woman uh, and she calls you up on uh, a Saturday evening saying her ex is threatening her and she's very scared and she's wondering if she can borrow your gun yeah. for a couple of days until she has a chance to go it. And you know this woman, uh, you know that she knows how to use guns, that she's trained and everything. Um, if you live in one of these states with universal background checks, if you lend her your gun, yeah. you are committing a felony yeah. and you will go to jail for yeah. five years. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> you know, uh, you go and you tell people that they have all these complications. It's not just sales. It's, you know, temporarily lending a gun yeah. to somebody who you know is well-trained and in need is in need is a felon. Uh, you know, so, you know, what's, What's this woman supposed to do? Uh, so they have all these laws um, that make it so that you have a lot of unintended consequences or possibly unintended consequences. Uh, you know, I'll give you another example. Um, uh, these universal background check laws, um, pretty much all of them have a requirement that you have to have a separate background check on each gun. So let's say, Jeff, you and I lived in Washington, D.C., which oh, is, God. you know, California has this, Colorado has this too. But in Washington, D.C., um, uh, it costs $125 to do a background check on a private transfer yeah. of a gun. Uh, let's say I'm going to give you four guns. It's just John giving Jeff <laughs> four guns. You think it's just one person giving one other person the guns. Yeah. It should just be one background check because yeah. we just, it's the same person getting all the guns. Yeah. No, they require a separate background check to yeah. be performed on each gun. Yeah. And so rather than $125, which is bad enough, yeah. it's going to cost $500 yeah. for me to transfer the guns. Now, somebody give me a rational explanation for why it's reasonable to have that additional cost for transferring it. Yeah. It's pretty clear. The, the whole point of the law yeah. is just to make it as costly as possible yeah. for people to be able to go and obtain a gun. And the thing is, who are they primarily discriminating against? Yes. A lot of these laws discriminate, again, against the people who need protection the most, the poor minorities 
who are living in these high yeah. crime urban areas yeah. who want to go and get a gun for protection. And the thing is, <clears throat> you know, uh, so they say there's 95, 97% for these uh, universal background checks. You know, uh, there are other problems that people don't talk about. So, I mean, I go through a couple of things. One is um, uh, you have all these errors in the system. So Biden or others will say uh, background checks have stopped 3.8 million dangerous prohibited people from getting a hold of a gun. Huh. Um, that's simply false. Yeah. What they should say is there have been 3.8 million initial denials. and probably something around 99% of those are mistakes. Yeah. It's one thing to stop a felon from buying a gun. It's another thing to stop somebody simply because they have a roughly phonetically similar name and similar birthday yeah. from being able to go and get it. And, you know, you fill out the 4473 and you put down your name, your address, your birthday, your race, your eye color, your uh, sex, your uh, your social security number, and you think they're using all that information, in the vast majority of the checks, they're just using roughly phonetically similar names and similar birthdays. Yeah. So, if, you know, <laughs> similar birthdays could be two people born in June of a particular year or something like that. And uh, <clears throat> the problem is um, uh, it particularly hurts certain groups. People tend to have names similar to others in their racial groups. Hispanics have names similar to other Hispanics. Mm -hmm. Blacks tend to have names similar to other blacks. 34% yeah. of black males have felony backgrounds. 18% of Hispanic males have felony backgrounds. Wow. Who's, you know, it's like 6% for whites, 3% for Asians. Whose names are their names most likely yeah. to be confused with? Yeah. Other uh, law-abiding, good Hispanic or black males. Yeah. And so through no fault of their own, yeah. they're going to be stopped from being able to go and buy a gun. These 3.8 million mistakes essentially out there. And there's really no reason why those mistakes should be occurring. If you have a company and you do background checks on your employees, if if somebody were to suggest to you that you should just look at roughly phonetically similar names and similar birthdays to go and do a background yeah. check, you'd think they're nuts. Yeah. How does that help me? And. You know there'd be lots of mistakes yeah. that would be occurring there. And in fact, if you did that, you'd be sued out of existence under federal law. If you had an error rate that was 100th the error rate that the federal government has, all you have to do is have the federal government have to meet the same standards for doing background checks that private companies have to meet. But gun control, and I've been telling gun control people about this for 20 years, they will fight you tooth and nail yeah. against the changes. So gun control people say, they just want reasonable regulations. And my response to them is, I just want reasonable fixes to your regulations yeah. that are there. That's a good point. And um, so another thing is these costs that we're talking about. You know, you know $125. Look, um, if, if, if you believe background checks are good, okay, uh, and gun control advocates will say that they think this is important in terms of reducing crime— there are a couple points to make there. Presumably, one, you want to encourage people to go and follow the law, right? How is making them pay these hefty penalties for going and obeying the law encouraging them yeah. for doing it? You don't tax things, yeah. essentially, that you want to encourage people to go and do. That's the, the opposite. <laughs> the, the second thing is um, if you believe that these background checks reduce crime, uh, and I'm skeptical of that. But if you believe that, then you believe it reduces crime for everyone, not just the law-abiding person who's going out of their way to go and obey the law huh. that's there. And so I would go and argue that if everybody benefits, everybody should pay. As an economist, you'd say the people who benefit should be the ones who pay. And so for both of those reasons, I would argue you should pay for it out of general revenue. I've been telling gun control people for over 20 years now that – uh, and I've, you know, when I've been in green rooms, or at least used to be, they won't participate in debates anymore. <laughs> but if uh, uh, they have essentially an agreement among the gun control groups that they will not debate me, but the in order to keep me off the air, yeah, and for stuff. sure. But the um, but I've been telling them for twenty years. I say, you tell me how important it is that you pass these universal background checks. I can 
if you make a, a few, three reasonable changes, you'll get it passed. And they will, they will refuse. I've, I've said, look, I'll write an op-ed with you that says, let's pass these universal background checks, uh, but with three reasonable changes. You know, uh, have, the federal, have the federal government have to meet the same standards for doing background checks that private companies do. Pay for the background checks out of general revenue uh, to encourage people to go and obey the law rather than penalizing yeah. them for doing it. And the other thing is, right now, uh, technically, uh, for background checks, uh, the federal government's only allowed to keep the records of a background check for 24 hours in order to stop them from putting together a national registry. Of course, Biden's putting together a national registry anyway yeah. with the stuff. But you know, the general idea is. You know, uh, limit how long you keep the background check information yeah. there, and um, uh, you know, I say you deal with those three things. You'll deal with uh, the concerns that people have. Of course, the media never mentions really the concerns that people have with the background checks, and uh, but <clears throat> you know, the interesting thing is uh, Bloomberg used to put. Uh, these universal background checks on the ballot. The last time he did that was in 2016 for Maine and Nevada. Um, in Maine, so if you really believe that 95 or 97 percent of the people who are voting support these laws, you would think you don't even have to spend anything. You just yeah. put it on the ballot and yeah, it'll pass. It'll pass. Uh, in Maine, they put it on the ballot, got unbelievably favorable news coverage. Uh, Bloomberg outspent the other side by 20 to 1, <sighs> and they still lost. And, uh, it and, says, that says something. Right. In Nevada, he outspent the other side by 3 to 1, unbelievably favorable news coverage, um, and it won technically by eight-tenths of one percentage point, a little bit less than 95%. And uh, um, uh, But the only reason why it even eked out was because uh, they didn't put in any uh, funding for it because they were worried that if they put in funding for it, nobody would go for it. They would lose, yeah. and which is given how narrow their win was, it seems pretty clear that yeah. they were right yeah. on that. Uh, and so uh, it wasn't able to go into effect at that time. And so anyway, but it's just um, you know it's also telling that Bloomberg is not putting them up on the ballot anymore. Well, the you know it's funny. Um, my family was personally touched with this background check, but not, not in the context that we're talking. Um, but when my children were old enough and we had to get them airline tickets, we found out that my younger son was on the no fly list. Uh, His so name, he was a terrorist. Yes, exactly. My six year old son right. at the time. Well, he started early. Yeah. Yeah. He's, you he's, know, he's, the he's, kids usually aren't <laughs> padded down. They're good ones. <laughs> they're, too. They're, so, yeah. They just send them right through. Um, and to try and the reason that we um, were told, because we never got, we never got definitive information, was that his name was similar yeah, 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 to right. another person's name that was on the watch list. Right. And they didn't bother to use or correlate that with his birth date, which obviously would have shown that he's only six years old. So, it, and to get him off that list, literally, we had we were writing politicians, we were writing, uh, we were trying to get everybody and anybody involved, and it was just right. Well, he's not the only one that's there. I mean, first of all. Uh, there's like oh, no quality control for no. putting a name, any name yeah. on the uh, no fly list. They essentially just a, a government agent, uh, just purely on their own thing, just yeah. out of being cautious exactly. can put somebody's name on the list. But uh, there's an interesting story. Uh, Congressman Thomas McClintock from California, when he had a something similar happen to him, when he was a state senator in California. Um, he, uh, um, had been on the no fly list <laughs> and, um, uh, the, uh, Capitol police in California tried to help him to get off the list and stuff like that. And, uh, finally, after a few years of running into this problem constantly, um, a federal agent kind of pulled him aside and said, look, <clears throat> when you buy your airline tickets, rather than having it as, uh, Thomas C. McClintock, can't remember what his middle name is. It yeah. was like Clinton or something. Yeah. But anyway, have it as T. Clinton McClintock. Yeah. 
And he did that, and he had no problem <laughs> getting on the planes yeah. at that point. Yeah. So uh, um, I can neither confirm nor deny that works. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know if you tried it with your son or not. <laughs> but it, it's frustrating because that will follow him for I don't know how long. It's it's it, it you know the, the whether or not that actually is helping or hurting um, create safer air travel. I have no idea. Because, uh, again, the government won't release any kind of information as it pertains to that. But uh, I do know that it, if it touches you, it is beyond an inconvenience. It's, oh, yeah, it's sure. Not, it's not easy. Well, I mean, and they're not the only ones. Uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, when he was alive, uh, I believe there were six times when he tried to fly on a plane where uh, he was stopped from being done. Now, now, of course, he was a U.S. senator, and he could call up somebody <laughs> and just yeah. say, you know, fix this. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And, uh, but it was still an inconvenience yeah, for him. absolutely. Because he had a name similar to somebody who was in Ireland who uh, they – put on the list. Now, maybe the guy in Ireland really did deserve to be <laughs> on the list. Fly list. Uh, well, it, it's frustrating. Um, but just an example of the problems with the background exactly. checks. Exactly. And uh, exactly. I think the Knicks system is even worse. Because, but anyway. <laughs> well, that was a whole, it was, uh, yeah, that, um, I'm not sure if it's gotten, I know that there's been a lot of work towards trying to fix it, you know, fix Knicks. Um, well, the fix Knicks bill that they had a few years ago um, Ted Cruz, uh, I was uh, talked to his office. I've known Ted since 2001 and, um, uh, his off, he tried to have an amendment to the fixed Nick's bill that would, um, uh, uh, fix the errors in the background check system, uh, where they would use the same, make the federal government have to meet the same standards that private companies nice. have to meet. But the Democrats said that that was a poison pill. And that they In would attack way? the. Re how is I mean how I, I'm confused by well they never really provide I I've I've been bringing this up as I say for over 20 years, and uh, the best explanation the only explanation I really get is you have to have a very broad net to make sure that uh, you don't let bad people through to right. go and get it okay but. Presumably, companies could go and say, look, I don't want to hire a former murderer or something like that. I want to have a broad net, too, yeah. that's there. And, uh, um, uh, but I, you know, uh, but they will, they will fight you if you try to make the rules for the companies as lax as they are for the government there. Oh, and uh, so, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, you know, as far as the fees go, I've never heard of a reasonable explanation for why they have to charge it per gun uh, transfer rather than just on the individual getting it and stuff. Uh, you know, my own belief, I was, I've come to the belief, unfortunately, that uh, the reason why they push a lot of these rules is just to make it as costly and difficult as exactly. they can for people to be able to go and get guns. Um, you know, in Texas here, um, uh, they've had a few major changes over the last decade yeah. in the concealed carry law. One of the things was reducing the fees from $140 down to $40. Yeah. Now, you know, Democrats claim that they care about minorities, that they claim, uh, care about the poor. Uh, uh, the Republicans all voted for reducing the fee. Uh, virtually all the Democrats voted against yeah. reducing the fee. I remember that. In the, in the state legislature. How is that vote consistent with them claiming that they, you know, support poor people or minorities that are there? Oh. Um, but you'll see after they had that change, uh, the percentage of permit holders in Texas who were black uh, went up yeah. a significant amount. Yeah. You had a big increase in permits total, but the share of permits for blacks rose. So, I mean— uh, uh, Democrats will fight free voter IDs as yeah. imposing too much of a burden yeah. on people to be able to go and vote. But, you know, $140 fee for people being able to go and carry a concealed handgun for protection, that's perfectly reasonable. I firmly believe that, you know, with the mo more recent wins, if you will, with regards to concealed carry laws in states, that the states are pushing back kind of as a petulant child by increasing the complication and the cost as a way of creating 
gun control by proxy. Yeah. And, you know, um, I have dear family and friends that live in Massachusetts that are undergoing a similar situation where now Massachusetts to get a license in Massachusetts was extremely difficult, costly, time consuming. Uh, you, you literally were laying your neck on the line when you had to go into the police station to get, you know, the interview with the uh, chief of police. And, um, with the recent passing of the new laws, obviously things have gotten easier for people. And the general, I was just out there in Massachusetts and the general consensus of the people that I interacted with was they were aware of the changes, but they still were um, concerned because there was, there was all the other hoops that the the new hoops that they had to jump through in order to still get a license, even though the the laws are changing, there's these new hoops that are popping up. I mean, uh, uh, Illinois kind of went through this uh, about a decade ago where uh, uh, they were forced as a result of courts to issue concealed carry permits. And uh, and D.C. also was forced mm-hmm. as a result of court decisions. And, you know, basically they have this attitude is if you're going to force us to do this, we'll issue the permits, but we're going to make it as costly exactly. and difficult as possible. So uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, compare Indiana to Illinois, two states that are right next to each other, similar in many ways. Yeah. Uh, in uh, Indiana, uh, over 22% of the adult population has a concealed carry permit. Wow. In, uh, in uh, Illinois, it's about 4%. Wow. Uh, why the difference? Well, it's pretty easy to explain the difference. Uh, in Indiana, up until about a year and a half ago, uh, it costs twelve dollars and ninety five cents to be able to go and get a concealed carry permit. Twelve dollars, and that was basically just for the cost of the background check. Yeah. Um, now they've even eliminated that fee. Wow. Uh, and uh, in Indi- Illinois, uh, it costs about four hundred and fifty dollars to go through the entire process to go and get four hundred and fifty dollars. Con- right. Well, it's. You have 16 hours of training, oh, and you also have a $150 okay, got fee. Got it. Now, there are other fees that one could add on, like for your FOID card yep. and other things that are there. But yep. just the permit, concealed carry permit, the toll costs are about $450. Wow. <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, it's not difficult to understand. You make it more costly, you're going to get fewer people do it. You raise the price of apples, people buy fewer apples. So true. And- uh, <clears throat> Um, but, uh, but it's, that's not the only thing or the most important thing. The other thing is if you're going to reduce crime, it's, it's related to the percentage of the adult population that has a permit, how risky it is for the criminals. So like if I have one in a thousand people caring versus one in 10, uh, (laughs) you know, criminals, if I only, only one in a thousand times, they're going to run into somebody who can protect themselves. They're not going to be that worried. If it's one in 10, they're going to be a lot more (laughs) worried about it. Uh, but it, but it's also important who gets the permit. So in Illinois, uh, the type of people who can afford to get the permit are basically wealthy whites who live in the suburbs. Yeah. Um, you know, that's fine. I'm glad that they're able to go and protect themselves, sure. but they're not the ones who are the most likely victims of violent crime. Yeah. In Indiana, you see a lot more concealed carry permits being given out uh, to people who live in heavily minority uh, zip codes. Yeah. And so in urban areas. Yeah. And so, you know, if, if I had the same percentage of the total population with permits in Illinois and Indiana, but in Indiana, it's mainly the people who are most likely victims of violent crime. Yeah. In Illinois, it's people who are rarely uh, uh, victims. You're still going to see a greater reduction in crime in Indiana yeah. than you're going to see in Illinois. It's, and so it's not just the percent, but it's also who gets the permits. And so, you know, here we have a very Republican state, Indiana, uh, where they have make it easy for poor and minorities to be able to go and get guns for protection. In Illinois, a state where they claim Democrats run things and they claim that they care about the Hmm. poor and blacks Hmm. and minorities, where they make it extremely difficult. And those weren't the only problems. When they, uh, for most of the time after Illinois passed its concealed carry law, um, there was no training facilities in Chicago. 
They made it essentially impossible yep. to set up a training facility in, in Chicago. So if you wanted to go and get training, you had to travel well outside of Chicago. Um, uh, you were banned being able to go and have uh, 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 even a permanent concealed handgun on any type of public transportation in yeah. Illinois. <laughs> so let's say you're a poor black who lives in Chicago yeah. and you don't own a car. Yeah. Uh, you can't go on public transportation to go <laughs> to work, get the training. Whatever. Right. Well, you also can't go to work with your gun yeah. or, or shopping if you have to go on the, the L or whatever. And uh, But beyond that, um, you know, you have to go and borrow a car uh, to go and uh, get the training. And if you, uh, given it 16 hours, uh, and the maximum amount of training you can do in a day is eight hours. Often they break it up into four-hour groupings. Uh, you'll have to borrow a car for either two or four days to be able to go and get the training for the permit there. So it's kind of like they say high cost, making it so that they can't travel there, making it so that it's you know no nearby training facilities and yeah. things like that. They kind of went through everything they possibly could, it seems like, <laughs> to make it so that poor blacks who live in some place like Chicago aren't going to be able to go and get training to be able to go and protect themselves and their families. That's very sad. The uh, the landscape, though, I mean, that's that's definitely a, an unfortunate situation. But the landscape that we're looking at with constitutional carry seems to imply, and I'm curious what your thoughts are, that we're seeing a change a potential change on the horizon. Uh, you know, we have potentially two more states, so that brings the total to 27 of the 50. What can that, what can we interpret or what does that translate to for the future, for laws and for other kinds of things? Right. Well, there are a couple of things that happen. And that is, um, and you saw this with the uh, concealed carry, right to carry debate in general. And that is, um, as more and more states uh, adopted right to carry laws, which were objective rules, which, you know, once you're a certain age, once you pass a criminal background check, once you pay your fee, uh, some of the states require training. <clears throat> but once you've uh, met those criteria and you apply for a permit, it's automatically granted. It's up to you to decide whether or not you want to get the permit or not. Right. Um, and then you had these seven May issue states right. uh, now, uh, uh, Massachusetts, New York, California, uh, where y you had to demonstrate some need to some local public official. But over the decades, um, the number of right-to-carry states has increased dramatically. Uh, you go back to the mid-'70s, there were like eight states that wow. had those rules at the time. And what would happen is uh, people would say, well, you know, uh, it's true, it's worked out okay in that state, but, you know, we're different here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and over time, as more and more states adopted these laws and uh, predictions of disaster were kind of proven wrong time after time, it became more and more difficult uh, to go and argue against those laws yeah. that are there. Uh, you've seen the same thing with constitutional carry. Um, and, uh, you know... It, it, Constitutional carry is really just a continuation of a trend. So we take Texas, where we're at right now. Uh, they passed their law in 96, the right to carry law. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, uh, there was a 10-hour training requirement to get a permit, 10-hour training requirement to renew the permit. Um, and then there was a $140 fee to go and get the permit. Uh, and there were like over 30 places listed as gun-free zones as yeah. examples uh, in the law there. Over time, you know, uh, the number of gun-free zones were reduced. Uh, they'd say, look, uh, you predicted disaster when the law first got passed. That didn't happen. Uh, we'd like to get rid of the gun-free zone in this area. And uh, and the uh, Democrats, the gun control people, said, well, it'll be disaster. Yeah. And then they got rid of it. And the disaster didn't happen. And so they'd come back and they'd get rid of another gun-free zone. Nice. And there'd, and there'd be the same predictions of disaster and it didn't happen. And then they'd come back and get rid of another one. Wow. And so gradually, you know, like churches one time or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I remember that. And uh, 
So they gradually, you know, schools, and they gradually uh, whittled that away. And the same thing with the fees. Uh, the fees, as we mentioned, were reduced from $140 to $40. Uh, the training requirements were reduced from uh, 10 hours to three to four hours. Uh, no re- mandatory training for renewal. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the constitutional carry is literally just a continuation of that trend. You know, rather than reducing it from 140 to 40, now it's from 40 to zero. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, rather than making a woman who's being stalked wait two months for the permit to be able to be issued, she can go and protect herself right away yeah. if a problem arises. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's been pretty much what we've seen happen here. And I think, so I don't really view the constitutional carry as some new thing that's going on. I just view, you you know, Texas is just an example. I've seen that in many other states, uh, you know, because they, when they first passed the laws, there were concerns, a lot of fears about what was going to happen. And so they had a lot of restrictions in there. And, uh, you know, take something like training. Um, I think anybody who carries a gun should be trained. Uh, uh, you need to know kind of what the costs and benefits are. You make a mistake, you could be a felon. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, a lot of these states, when they require training, um, you get all sorts of st- stupid things that gets put in there. In California, for example, uh, uh, they have 16 hours of training, two hours of those are on safe storage yeah. of guns. And uh, uh, basically, it's just an indoctrination session yeah. to try to make people uh, unjustifiably more fearful of having a gun in the home than they should be. And uh, so you get politicians there that go and put in things. So as part of the compromises to yeah. go and get these laws passed, you know, they'll say, okay, if you put in training and they have to go and learn about these things, well, I'll vote for it. And, uh, um, uh, but what's interesting is that, uh, when you've moved to constitutional carry, even though the number of permits don't increase or maybe are starting to fall now, uh, it's pretty clear that the number of people who are carrying are increasing. You know, just like when you saw the reduction in the fees from $140 to $40 in Texas, there was a big increase in the number of people who carried and who got permits. Well, going from forty dollars to zero, I'm sure there's an increase. Um, I only have I have data for two states, uh, for Idaho and Kansas, but it's very clear that the number of people going and getting training, even though training was no longer mandated, increased significantly in really? both of those states huh. uh, because you have law-abiding people who know they don't want to get into trouble, yeah. but they go and get the training voluntarily yeah. t- to know what the rules are. Yeah. But the other thing is uh, the training changed. The people who are offering the training uh, uh, changed the courses without kind of the intervention of the politicians about what should be included there. So that the training, I think, became more useful training uh, that actually was more effective. So the cost of the training went down. What they got was more useful for them. And you saw a lot more people going and getting the training. I think that's great. I, I mean, I feel as though, you know, um, I, I, I would like for people to be vested in in learning, education, and training. I, I feel like it's in their best interest. I think it's in the public's best interest that they have a little bit more insight. Um, you know, when when Texas passed the. Uh, you know, the, the bill itself was called permitless law, but when they passed that, you know, I still encouraged people to get their LTC because the LTC program here in the state of Texas has some pretty good information about the law, uh, like what you can and can't do, right. which I felt was helpful, uh, for somebody that did, was just coming in and not knowing. I also encouraged them uh, that if they traveled and this was, you know, now things are getting, now we have 25 States, but back then I don't think we did the reciprocity that you could achieve through having your LTC right. was valuable. And then the big one I still promote is the fact that with the LTC, there was 
um, no background check required because your LTC came with one. So you could go into a gun store and literally purchase a firearm. And we saw that during the pandemic uh, that the Nixus system literally crashed and people weren't able to. Well, the Nixus system crashes now. Anyway. <laughs> I should I should say it crashed more <laughs> during right. that time period. But, you know, people that had a LTC were able to come in, walk out same day with a firearm. Sure. No. Look, all those are benefits. I have no problem with people getting permits. Um, but since... They don't need it as much when they travel because you have so many states yeah. that are constitutional carry. Uh, you are now, for a while, when a state became constitutional carry, basically they just didn't see the increase in permits right. that uh, you saw in other states that didn't weren't constitutional carry. Now, over the last year or so, you've started to see a drop in the permits issued in those states. But look... <clears throat> um, you know, in some sense, maybe my ideal world would be one where uh, uh, people would have a permit, but no uh, uh, mandatory, uh, no fees and mm -hmm. no training requirement. And uh, and um, the main reason is that um, uh, I think that uh, m the objections against people caring is that, well, you know, they'll commit crimes and yeah. other things. Yeah. And, with the concealed carry permit data, I can go and show how incredibly law-abiding permit holders are. So, yeah. uh, you know, I can't do that with constitutional carry. But um, uh, in Texas, for example, uh, you can compare I, I have data. There's data nationwide for crimes by police officers, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, if you look at Texas and Florida, um, uh, permit holders are convicted of firearms related violations at about one twelfth the rate the police officers are convicted of firearms related violations huh. and and police officers are rarely convicted of firearms related violations at about one twentieth the rate of the general population Wow so permit holders are convicted at a rate about one less than one two hundredth the rate of yeah. uh, firearms uh, violations for the general population, even though they're carrying guns. Wow. But <clears throat> look, I people, if you are in a constitutional carry state, um, you want to learn the laws simply because if you make a mistake, you can become a felon. And, uh, you know, then your life's going to be unalterably changed. Oh, so you have to know question. when you can go and use a gun. One thing I will say, though, is that law-abiding citizens uh, who are caring tend to be very reticent, maybe in some cases almost too reticent, to go and use their gun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah. so, you know, it's one reason why they don't run into a lot of problems there. You know, they only use it when it's like absolutely, absolutely, sure. absolutely necessary yeah. to go and pull it out. Uh, in, in fact, maybe because even if they don't know the particular of the laws, they just err on the side of caution yeah. with regard to Absolutely. doing it. But it's still useful just for your own peace of mind uh, to know what the rules are on those things. Well, I couldn't agree with you more on that. And and I want to make it clear that I'm not saying that you have to have those. I I was relaying some of the benefits my from my observations, uh, as in particular of recent times going through the pandemic. Um, I sure. think the biggest thing was uh, people were I wouldn't necessarily go so far as to say frantic about trying to purchase a firearm, but emotions were high about them not being able to get a firearm yeah, sure. because well, the background checks were. Well, a lot of states are like, I can't remember the number of states exactly, but it's maybe like 20 states yeah. that just stopped issuing concealed carry permits during the pandemic. Yeah. So here you had a situation where <laughs> law enforcement was falling apart. Yep. And uh, and yet at the same time, people weren't being allowed to legally go and defend themselves. Yeah. And to be honest, I think that's one reason why we've seen over the last couple of years the spate of passage of constitutional carry laws, yeah. because people realize that in these types of emergencies, uh, you may not be able to go and get your permit. And so <laughs> yeah. you have to have a safety yeah. valve there. And yeah. I think- it's a, a type of argument that I've heard many times. I know in Georgia and other places where permits uh, basically were stopped uh, uh, in Florida. I think wow. it's going to be an issue that's going to come up when they go and and uh, pass the law uh, this year. Yeah, I agree. Let me ask you this question. So 
I know, um, you know, being involved in the, the, like the subject matter of, of gun control and, and sharing with everybody the many of the falsehoods or in some cases, flat out lies about, um, or that the gun control movement is trying to use, what's been the hardest thing that you've had to kind of like overcome since, since the first book came out? Hardest thing in what sense? Well, um, <clears throat> whether it be the change to your, uh, like, I guess with, when the book came out, you probably weren't expecting to have as much pushback. How has that affected you? Has that, uh, has that changed your? Is it has it strengthened your resolve as far as the data? Has it has it given you regrets as far as well? Maybe I shouldn't have gone down this road and released all this information. What has been kind of like the? I guess that was a very poorly framed question in the beginning, but I'm I'm interested in like you know what your thoughts are now looking back at the book. Your belief was this the right thing to do? Do I did I second guess myself? Am I glad I did it? Do I wish I'd done it differently? Uh, well, I wish I'd waited till I got tenure before <laughs> I did some of the stuff. <laughs> but, uh, Good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, it basically completely mucked up my academic career. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, I've had periods where I've been unemployed uh, afterwards. Yeah. Um, when uh, my book came out in May of 98 from the University of Chicago Press and, uh, in November of 1998, uh, so I'm at the University of Chicago, Mayor Daly, the mayor of Chicago, called up uh, Hugo Sonnenstein, the president of the University of Chicago. And it's my understanding, uh, Daly spent 45 minutes or so talking to Hugo about all the wonderful things that the city wanted to go and do with the university. And then at the end of the conversation, told uh, Hugo that uh, Lott's continued presence at the University of Chicago was going to do, quote, irreparable harm to the relationship between the city and the school. Holy shit. And then uh, uh, two days later, I was basically called into a meeting with the dean and uh, a professor who was a strong supporter of mine. And uh, Dan Fischel, who was the dean, said, uh, you know, John, you've probably been the worst treated person in academia. Uh, he said, but uh, we're going to have to let you go. Holy shit. And I said, uh, you know, Dan, you know, you let me go in the middle of a school year. You're going to completely destroy my academic career. And uh, I won't go through all the blow by blow. But uh, basically, after going back and forth for a while, uh, the agreement was that if I promised not to talk to the media anymore, uh, they would let me stay at the University of Chicago until the end of the year. And uh <sighs> So anyway, uh, I I don't know if you remember what 1999 was like. Oh yeah, but there was a huge push in Congress for all these for for massive gun control bill. Yeah, and uh, um, uh, Max Boot, who was the op ed editor at the Wall Street Journal at the time. So anyway, so in '98, I'm doing massive news and radio and TV from like when the book came out. Well, actually, a little bit after when the book came out, which is a story by itself, uh, up until November. And then all of a sudden, I just go radio silent uh, to stop doing anything. And uh, anyway, uh, uh, in February and so on, uh, Max is calling me up like weekly <laughs> uh, saying, you know, you got to write an op-ed piece for the Wall Street Journal. You got to do it. Nobody else can do this. Nobody else will, is willing to do it. Nobody else knows the numbers and stuff the way you do. You got to write us a piece. And I kept on telling him no. And then finally, I guess in March, uh, I convinced myself. I said, are they really going to kick me out of the University of Chicago for writing an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal? I mean, I th I've kind of convinced myself that it would be just too embarrassing for them. So I finally wrote a piece uh, for, for Max. And I'm told it had a big impact on the vote in the Senate right before they did it. Wow. But, um, uh, anyway, uh, and then normally they had a 90 day rule for writing op-eds in the wall street journal that you had to, they wouldn't take any piece from anybody unless 90 days had passed. And I had a piece in April and I had a piece in May. And then I went to Yale and, uh, 
I was at Yale for two years. The second year, beginning of the second year that I was at Yale, um, I was uh, asked to go and testify by some members of the Hawaii State Legislature on a ch bill that they had to go and change the registration licensing laws. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> before I went out, I told the legislators that were inviting me, I said, look, uh, you tell me that the Honolulu police chief is going to be testifying for the bill. Um, I want you to go and tell him in advance that there are two questions that you're going to ask because I, I, I don't want him to be able to say that he can't answer the question and I don't want him to feel sandbagged by these things. Nice. And so <clears throat> the two questions were, one, uh, how many crimes uh, have they been able to solve as a result of registration licensing since, that they've had since 1960 in Hawaii? And how much does it cost each year to go and run the program? And uh, so I'm there in the room. The Honolulu police chief gets asked how many crimes uh, they've been able to solve uh, as a result of licensing and registration. And he says zero. <laughs> I knew that was going to be the answer. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it's the same answer you see time after time, and we can talk about why that's the case. But anyway, um, uh, and then they said, well, how much does it cost? And he said, well, he doesn't really have a dollar figure, but he estimates it takes about 50,000 hours worth of police time each year to go and run the licensing and registration oh, program. Cow. So the, you could just feel the air go out of the room when, uh, when uh, he gave the answers to that. Uh, I end up going and testifying after him. And, uh, but anyway, you know, so the point is, is that if he could point to thousands of crimes that he'd been able to solve, then there'd at least be some trade off. 50,000 hours worth of police time each year is police time that you could use to yeah. really solve and prevent crimes. That's a lot of police That's time. That's a lot. <clears throat> and, uh, but the fact that they couldn't point to any, and you know, you're wasting 50,000 hours of police time yeah. each year. That could be used. That you're, you know that it's a bad use of time. That you could reduce crime by reallocating your resources there. So anyway, the bills were bill was defeated. Good. And so I go back to Yale, and a couple of days later, uh, I get a call from uh, Susan Ronis Ackerman, the associate dean. Uh, Tony, the dean, apparently had gotten calls from both the U.S. senators from Hawaii. Uh, complaining that I had testified in Hawaii and that they were upset that I had been responsible for killing the bill that they thought was important there. And uh, uh, so anyway, Susan said uh, um, my time at Yale was going to be up. They weren't going to allow me to stay any longer. Oh my God. Uh, so anyway, uh, um, then I was unemployed for like, so I have to understand at this point, we're talking about 2001. Um, I, uh, uh, there was a ranking that came out of uh, economists around the world for publications from 1969 through 2000. I didn't start publishing until like 86. But um, uh, I was fourth in the world in terms of t over that whole period, even though I didn't start publishing uh, until – halfway through in terms of total pages published in peer-reviewed economics journals. I was 26th in the world in terms of quality-adjusted pages. Wow. Uh, and uh, uh, anybody in the top 300 had like a chaired professorship at a top, uh, you know, five or so university. And uh, so uh, I couldn't get a job. Wow. In any place. And um, uh, basically because – uh, the word was out that if I got, you know, I people would get upset. Politicians yeah. would get upset. Yeah. Nobody wants to do that. Yeah. So anyway, I was unemployed for like seven months. <clears throat> I finally ended it. It landed a job at uh, the American Enterprise Institute. Um, and uh, the um, uh, anyway, um, uh, but it turns out when I got there, uh. George Soros's group and Open Society and I guess some others had gotten a hold of a list of donors at uh, AEI and they started harassing them. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole story there, but anyway, it basically ended up uh, 
eventually affecting uh, my being able to go and stay there. Wow. So then I was unemployed again for a little while. And uh, anyway, it's just, uh, it's just kind of a mess. So, um, you know, it created all sorts of problems. But, uh, you know, I look back and, uh, you know, it's, I guess it's just I have mixed feelings For about sure. getting involved in the debate on this stuff. Well, I can tell you unequivocally that I am grateful. I know that means probably very little given the hardship that you've had to endure over the last 20 plus years. But I I can point to things that have significantly changed our future and the release of your book, the involvement that you have with, in this case, all the different types of testimony that you've given, the committees that you've been on has significantly changed the landscape that we're in right now. So I know I'm very grateful for that. I know, like I said, that probably doesn't mean a lot now, but well, thank sure. you. Thank you for all that. I'm going to start wrapping things up here and I've got one final question. What's the biggest takeaway that you want our listeners to walk off with? Well, I mean, I guess the biggest thing that I have uh, is that uh, if my research convinces me of anything, it's that police are extremely important in reducing crime. I think the police are the single most important factor for reducing yes, crime. love it. But I think police understand themselves that they virtually always arrive on the crime scene after the crimes occurred. And that raises too. <laughs> and that raises the question what people should do when they're having to confront a criminal by themselves. And it turns out that having a gun is by far the safest course of action for people to take. And it's particularly important for the most vulnerable people in our society. The people who are most likely victims of violent crime, poor blacks who live in high crime urban areas, and people who are relatively weaker physically, women and the elderly, as we've talked about before. And uh um, so, you know, I think it's important, uh, to realize that a lot of these gun control laws, uh, primarily make it difficult for the most vulnerable people in our society to be able to go and protect themselves, whether it be the different fees that are involved or whether it be the delays in being able to go and protect oneself if a woman's being stalked or threatened. Uh, you know, these laws... Uh, whether intentionally or not, and unfortunately I've come to believe it's more intentional than anything <laughs> else. Agreed. Uh, um, you know, are, are set up so that the most vulnerable people are remain vulnerable yeah. and can't protect themselves. And that, uh, um, you know, uh, the fact that I mentioned earlier, I just think this simple fact is something that you just can't ignore. And that is, Every place in the world that's banned either all guns or all handguns, if you look at the change in crime before and after the ban, yeah. every single time murder rates have gone up uh, and gone up by substantial amounts. If guns really on net are bad, then you should have clearly seen at least all the time or most of the time or For at sure. least some of the time For or sure. at least once or twice drops in murder rates right after the ban went into effect. And yet- Instead, and yet every single time, uh, murder rates went up. <laughs> no surprise, I guess, um, for me in my head, my little peon brain, that doesn't surprise me. Well, let's let's talk about where can people learn more about you, the Crime Prevention Research Center. Where can I direct people to go and learn more? Well, our, uh, Crime Prevention Research Center, we're basically a group of academics who do research on these topics. Mm -hmm. We don't do Second Amendment type arguments, like I haven't made Second Amendment arguments when we've been talking. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, our website is crimeresearch.org, crimeresearch.org. Uh, and, you know, people hopefully can get a lot of information. Oh, there's from there. a ton there. There's a lot. And uh, uh, we have books that are there. I have. Uh, stuff that I have 10 books. Uh, Nikki Gozer has uh, her book. She's our executive director. She's someone uh, who's been victimized by gun-free zones. And I think her story is very powerful. But we have others that are involved with the center and uh, we get a lot of work done. I love it. I love it. All right, folks. Well, that's a wrap. John, thank you very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. 
Uh, I want to thank our audience for tuning in. I want to thank our sponsors. And I want to thank the men and women for holding the line. You can check out all our previous podcasts by visiting bulletproofworkshop.com. Learn more about me and train opportunities by visiting tridentconcepts.com. Until then, I'm Jeff Gonzalez, and you're listening to the Bulletproof Workshop podcast. Stay safe or be dangerous. Mm-hmm.